Hi, my name is Manley Midget, and I'm the state and national event leader for Mission Possible. And today I wanted to talk about the event for this year. And most of all, everything that I talk about today relates to North Carolina. And if we talk about clarifications or exceptions or whatever, they all apply to North Carolina and not the national. So let's start with the event Mission Possible. Here's the object of the event. I've underlined four words there that are very important. The students should design, build, test, and document a Rube Goldberg-like device that completes the task through a series, using a series of simple machines. So they should build it and test it, and then I'll, I will talk about documenting it later. And the, do you accept the challenge is the question here. We should play the music now. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to make one point before we get going. I want to make two points about the event. Um, at regionals this year, there's no impound for your Mission Possible devices. That means when the event period starts, that's when all the devices should be there at that time. However, at the state level, we do have impound because the teams don't know the exact length of time their device has to run. So we have impound and usually all the teams bring their device to one location that's designated by the tournament director early in the morning and they leave them and at the state since we have so many devices teams sign up for a time period to come in and they can come in when they want and set up their device and run it however they cannot do any changing or correcting or whatever on their device throughout the day uh, we don't tell them the time the ideal time or target time until they show up to run their device so there is an impound at the state no impound at regional tournaments safety is our first concern so the very first thing that we tell the students is that they got to wear their high impact safety spectacles while they're setting up the device so at any time when the device is being set up or run they need to wear those spectacles the team can get in real trouble if we see them not wearing them we're going to remind them but then after they're reminded once they might we might ask ask them to leave the event if they're not going to wear their goggles so that's pretty serious we want them to be safe and not get hit in the eye with any objects that from their device or other people's device it might not be their device that or something flies out and hits them it might be a team that's working next to them and so the devices that they build should be free of hazardous materials and we have a list in the rules it's important to look at every one of these last year we had a lot of teams that came into tournaments with lead in their device like fishing sinkers and things like that they didn't think about that because they hadn't just purchased or bought lead but they had sinkers that you would use for fishing and those were made out of lead and some devices had those in 10 or 12 places so no lead objects in the device of course no flames and all these you see the list there the hazardous materials no electricity so we're not using batteries or electric circuits within the devices this year and when a team comes in they can set up their device in 10 minutes and if they're ready and we're ready to run it we'll run it and if they set their device up and they are ready to run in less than 30 minutes, they'll get 50 additional points. If it takes them more than 30 minutes, they just won't get the 50 points. Sometimes teams are ready to run and we aren't quite ready because there are so many teams. So we ask them to wait a little bit. That doesn't hurt their time. There'll be somebody there they can notify that they're ready to run and they can get their 50 points. So they'll just have to, to wait until we're ready to run their device. Now, one thing I like to say to coaches is when you're working with a team and you've got all these events on Olympiad that are going on and you're coaching and working with, with all of them, it's hard to keep up with all the specifications in every construction event. Therefore, I wouldn't ask the students directly, oh, did you follow all the rules? Do you meet all specifications? Because guess what they're going to say? They're going to say, yes, we did. And then in most cases, we find out maybe they didn't. Uh, or in many cases. So it's important that the students check and double check and triple check their device. We have a score sheet that's online you can get and use the score sheet as a checklist for all the things that they should be doing. And we'll go through those in just a second. You can find all those specifications in section three of the rules. Violations in this section are very important. If they have a construction penalty they're going to be put in a different tier, which is below all the teams that were construction penalty free. In other words, if a team 
has a device that's not a very good device, but it meets all the construction parameters, it's in the top group. It might be at the bottom of the top group, but another team could have a device that works great, but they break one construction rule, they're going to be placed below that other team. So it's important to have no construction violations. And what I mean by that is your device is built so that it's intended to start correctly. And I'll talk about the start in a minute. It's also built to end correctly with the final task. It operates autonomously. That means the students are not allowed to have a tether or a remote control or they're actually operating part of the device themselves. The device, once you start it, should go from start to finish. Now, it may stop and you'll get penalties for that, but the device has to run on its own. The students can't do all the tasks in the device. Those tasks should be in a consecutive sequence. Visible means uh, there's a rule that one side, the top, should be open or at least clear so that the event leaders can see all the transfers. They have to be able to see what's happening in the device so that you can get the points. And, and we can give you all the points you deserve. So make sure it's visible, not enclosed. We can't give you points that's for something that happened in a box we couldn't see inside of. This is a difficult one for some teams. No parallel paths. What that means is when your device is doing whatever it's doing, you can't have a, a case where the action splits and this action runs off a chain of reaction goes over here and another one goes over here. And you have two different paths of action going on at the same time. Those are parallel paths. You can't have a dead end path. That means you start one and it dead ends over here and then this goes, the device goes another direction. That's almost like parallel paths and one of them was just a dead end. Uh, those are not allowed if you have those. Even one of those, that's a construction penalty. An object in the device can't be used more than once. So if an object is used in a transfer between two simple machines, that object, the device can't come around and use that object again. It can only be used once. And that's a difficult one for the event leaders to catch sometimes, but it catches some teams they don't see it themselves. And then all tasks must contribute to the final task. So even if it's a task you don't number and you don't plan to count for points, again, no dead end pass. So everything must contribute to the next one in a sequence. And this year, this is very important, this year gravity has to be used for the potential energy. When the device starts, the team cannot have springs and things already loaded or anything electrical or, or it, it's something wound up that's going to be released later. They can't have any of those things. They cannot have a mouse trap that's been set and ready to go or a rat trap or anything. It's, there's one spring allowed. The rules say there's one spring allowed and I'll talk about that spring in a minute. And that's allowed at the start. But there can be no other springs that are cocked and ready to go or wound up or anything like that. Even that spring I'm talking about is not compressed at the beginning of the event. So gravity has to give you all your energy this year. So things in your device are going to be knocked off that fall and pull strings and cause other, device, other things to move and operate all the different parts of the device. So gravity is the big thing this year, the energy form using. To start the device correctly will get you 100 points. 100 points and this year the device starts like a pinball machine. If you can see a, this picture of a plunger, um, the, what the students would do is this plunger, most of this plunger would be really inside the device, but actually this piece counts as part of the device. So we don't measure the device from here, we measure it from the end of the plunger. But this will be attached to the device somehow so that when you pull the plunger back, it compresses the spring and when you release it, it pushes the plunger back in the device and that gives it a lot of force to do something. That's the only place you can compress the spring in the device yourself. And even in this case, it's not already compressed to start with. So the, the team, one of the team members pulls the plunger out and we say, ready, set, go. They let go of the plunger, we start the clocks and that's how your device starts. Now the rules say that this plunger must return to, it says within the device, but really its original position. If we measure the end of this plunger as the end of the device, where that red arrow is, if we've measured that, and when you let go of it, it should return to that spot. And then you're okay. You'll get your 100 points. If this plunger starts the next action, if you pull this plunger, nothing happens. 
and the team member has to go inside and start the next action, then the team will not get the 100 points. This plunger has to start the next action after it's released. Okay, in this case, size does count. The device must get through doors. If you build a really big device, you can't get through the door or get it in the car, you're going to have a problem putting it back together. Also, this year, uh, the dimensions are 60 by 60 by 60, and if one dimension is greater than 60, there'll be a 25-point penalty. If two are bigger, there's 25 more points. If the third one's larger also, that will be 25 more points. So there could be 75 penalty points if the device is oversized all three directions. Some teams build their device exactly 60 by 60 by 60, and then something expands in the humidity or whatever, or moves, and, or they don't measure the bolts on the back of the board, which do count, and if we find out it's more than 60, then they get penalized. So we suggest that you build the device so that you know 100% true that it's one, less than 60 centimeters in every dimension. And for each full centimeter that the device is shorter or smaller than 60 in one dimension, you get a point per centimeter. Or in this case, it says a tenth of a point for a tenth of a centimeter that is smaller. It's easier to think of that as like one point per meter and we measure it in, uh, per centimeter and we measure it in millimeters. So if a device were, say, 57 by 57 by 57, they'd get three points for each dimension and they'd get nine extra points on their score. We had some devices last year that are only 15 or 20 centimeters in one dimension. So they got like 45 points right there just for having a small size. Uh, remember that dial rods and bolts and things sticking out the back of the device are measured. So it's the complete measurement. The plunger is out on one side. We measure from the end of the plunger to the far end of the device. Now, one of the main points of, of the whole event is to have simple machines within the device that go from the starting task to the ending task. You're limited to up to 18 that can count the points. And for a simple machine to count, it's got to be one of the six types, and that simple machine operates another simple machine of a different type successfully to start another action. And if that happens, the team's awarded 50 points. But it has to go to a different type. And we count the points for the first one. So if it's lever to pulley, you get 50 points for the lever. It has to be different. So next time when you come to a lever, lever to pulley is not unique. It mentions unique is underlined there. So you only get points for lever to pulley one time. Lever can go to a screw or a lever to a wheel and axle, something like that, and then if it's unique and if it works successfully, 50 points. So it's the first one in the sequence that counts for the points. There are six types. I'll go through those in just a minute. Each type can be used up to three times as the beginning one. So if you use a lever four times, that fourth one's not going to count for points. It's only the first three times. And each of those three times, it has to go to a different machine than it did before. There's also an extra thing about the levers. The mechanical advantage of machines must be used for them to count. Um, so if you're using a lever or any of the machines, you just can't have a machine just like a lever just move and do nothing. You ha have to do something with that machine and use its mechanical advantage. Let's, let me talk about levers. There are three kinds of levers. And so if you use each of the three kinds, you can only use each one once if you did that. To start a different machine, you get an extra 50 points. There are three classes of levers. Most levers look a little bit like this, where you have a load on one end, something like that, and you push something down on the other end and it picks it up. That's the first class lever. Some levers look, work like a wheelbarrow where the fulcrum's at the bottom and the load's in the middle and you'd pick this up. That's a second class lever. Now a third class lever is like a broom. That's where somebody would hold the top of it. This is the fulcrum. They grab it. The effort's in the middle and, and the, force, the resistance is on the floor. That's a third class lever. That's the hardest type we found for students to use in their device. First class levers are easy. You can use a first class lever three times if you want to. Each time it's got to go to a different machine, the next simple machine. Or you can use a first class lever to something, a second class lever to something different, 
and a third class lever to something even different again, and you could get the extra 50 points. But you get 50 points for every one of those transfers if they're successful, and you can get up to 50 extra ones. Okay, pulleys. I got just a drawing of a pulley here. I'm not going to string some pulleys today, but I want to point out the pulley that I'm showing you here would not count. It's a simple pulley, the simplest. You got a load here, and here's the effort. Somebody pulls it, or maybe something falls and pulls this down, and this goes up. And so, but for a pulley to count, it has to have an IMA greater than one. You're going to have to ask your teacher to explain what an IMA is. That's an ideal mechanical advantage. You can look it in the web, in books, and the teacher can tell you. But a single wheel pulley is not going to have IMA. This IMA is one, exactly one. It has to be greater than one. So you're going to have to have multiple wheels, and they're going to have to be strung so that they have a mechanical advantage greater than one. That means if I pull something five pounds worth, I could pick up something heavier than five pounds. So you'll have to explore and learn what IMA is. Also, the object that's lifted has to be lifted at least 10 centimeters vertically to count. So if you're lifting and it only goes five and it trips the next machine but continues going, that won't count. It has to go at least 10 and then start the action of the next machine. So keep that in mind. We had a lot of levers, a lot of pulleys last year that it started and went about halfway, started something else, but then kept moving and students wanted to credit that it moved 10. It has to move 10 centimeters, lift something before that something starts the next action. So it's before the object initiates the next action. Now, incline planes, I got kind of a, I can use the same stick here for a simple one, but an object has to be pushed or pulled. It can be pushed or pulled up an incline plane, up an incline plane. Something going down the incline plane doesn't count. But what most teams do is have a string here and something falls that's been knocked off earlier and it has a string with a little wheel here and it falls and the string's attached to this mass and it pulls the mass up the incline plane. The rules say though that it has to go at least 10 centimeters vertically, not 10 centimeters along the plane, 10, 10 centimeters. It has to go 10 centimeters, so it's raised 10 centimeters higher. And also, it shouldn't roll. The rules tell you that it must not roll. Okay, so. And you can see all those things here. Pushed or pulled up, not rolled, at least 10 centimeters vertically, and it starts the next action. Also, the rules say it has to be continuous and the incline plane itself must be stationary. So it's not like you can have the object here and move the plane. you got to move the object. Okay. Wedges. Okay, wedges go between two objects. I've got a picture there of wood being split. Something being split does not count as a wedge in the rules. To count as a wedge, you have to have two objects touching each other and then the wedge is pushed between the objects so that it separates them and one of the objects may, may fall and cause something else to happen. So the object that's separated, one of the two things that separate, has to cause the next action. A lot of teams will use the, the balls because it's easy to get them to touch and the wedge can go between them. But, but last year we had a lot of teams that had two objects there but they weren't touching. It says wedges do not split an object but must separate two touching objects and one of the objects has to start the next action. Another form of simple machines would be a screw, and the main requirement here is the screw must turn two full rotations to operate the next task. So what happens oftentimes, teams use something that looks like this. They might have a nut or something that's in a permanently fastened position, and they have a screw here, and they might have something wound around here that will turn this screw and it has to turn two full rotations. So they mark, they mark it, the rules say it must be marked, so that we can see that it goes at least two full rotations. And it goes two full rotations, and as it does, it advances, and this, by virtue of it being screwed in, it hits something and knocks something off that continues the next action. So it has to be turned two full rotations, at least. It can be turned more, advance, cause the next action. So that's a screw. This is the one that was most difficult last year for students, was the wheel and axle. A simple car rolling up an incline plane 
that doesn't count. It doesn't count for two. You can't count two simple machines for the same action. So this could not be an inclined plane and a wheel and axle. Plus, something rolling up an inclined plane, let's say you didn't want to count the plane, it can't count as a wheel and axle because these wheels just turn freely. The axle has to do something. It just rolling up and down doesn't count. So it's, it's like the picture there. The picture can be very helpful. It's like people used to uh, pick up a bucket in a well. But you see here where if somebody had a string on the wheel and they pull the string, it makes the wheel turn. The axle turns at the same time. There's a string wound around the axle. So they pull this one. It turns, makes this turn at the same time. And when you pull this down, this one winds up and, and picks the load up. So for a wheel and axle to count, you have to either, the machine has to operate the wheel, which makes the axle do something, or operates the axle, which makes the wheel do something. And by virtue of the force that operates the first one, like the wheel, then the axle has to use a force to lift something. Or if you operate the axle, the wheel would have to exert a force to lift something. Just spinning freely doesn't count. We actually had teams last year that had something uh, well, it looked like a wheel and axle just spinning freely. It didn't count as uh, operation. It has to lift something at least 10 centimeters before that object that's been lifted starts the next action. So it's the object that starts the next action. Now, before you go to the competition, you'll need to make a transfer sequence list. Some teams overlooked this last year and they got to the competition. They did not have this list. Look, just having the list, you get 25 points for each of these things. If you give the list to the tournament director, they'll tell you usually they can bring the list at the beginning of the event. Even at the stake, that's the case. We want to see that list. When you bring your device in, it's impounded at the stake. You bring your list then. At regionals, it's not impounded. So when you come to the event, you bring your list. 25 points. If the list is in the correct format, and there's a format on the web, 25 points. If it's accurately intended, now something might not work, but if we look at it and it says what your device looks like it was built to do, 25 more points. Then if you number the steps on the list and they match numbers you put on things in the device so we can follow the action, 25 more points. So a team can get automatically 100 points for doing these things with their list. That list is pretty important and we need to be able to read that list. Now the final task after all these machines have operated, you could have 18. Not many teams had 18 last year. You might have two or three, but I encourage you to have as many as you can, but you should at least have two or three. So you have two or three transfers or more. Then you're going, last thing you're going to do this year is raise a flag. Okay, the, the flag must be like a mailbox flag. Now it shouldn't be a mailbox flag because a mailbox flag is usually plastic or metal. But there are 10 requirements. You'll get 250 points, but you need to make a checklist and do all these things. It must be like a mailbox flag. It must be at least 50 square centimeters, the flag part. This one's about 80. When you start the device, it must be, it must end up entirely above the device. Like if this is the top of the device here, at the ending, that entire flag must be above the device. This would not count if this is the top, let's use this board here. If this board were the top of the device and the flag does this, that doesn't count. It only counts if that entire flag is above the top of the device at the end. It could do that and stop. It doesn't have to be completely like this, but it's got to clear the device. And I'll talk about it stopping in a minute. But it's got to clear the device entirely above it. That's another requirement. It must start completely in the device. The whole flag and pole and everything must be completely in the device and must be below the top of the device. The flag itself must be made of rigid cardboard this is just a piece of corrugated cardboard cut from a box. No bends or folds, so you can't, you can't unfold itself. Just a flat piece of rigid corrugated cardboard. Now this one doesn't have it, but it should clearly have the name of the team, which will be your school, and the team number. Should be on the flag, clearly. And the pole, it does say that when you start the device, the pole must start parallel to the ground. The pole can't start like this or like this and come up like this. It can't do this. It's got to be like this and raised like a mailbox flag. And the flag has to be easily removable so that we can measure it. This one comes off very easily. It doesn't fall off, but it's easily removable. The flag comes right off the pole. 
Okay. And the attachment things in North Carolina, we're not going to argue much over the attachment parts. We're going to look at the piece of cardboard and be able to measure it. And you can have whatever you have, string or tape or fabric or whatever wrapped around so that it stays on the pole. But it should be easily detachable. Okay, like this one is. If you do that, you get 250 points. So think about it. If a team starts right and ends right, that's 100 plus 250, 350. They've got a couple, three machines, that's another 150. So we get a lot of points there. Now timing. We start the stopwatches when the plunger's released. So you pull the plunger, we say ready, set, go, we start the clocks. The clock stops when the flag stops moving. Or when 60, it says, it says, or 180 seconds is reached. Here's what that means. Let's say we've had some devices that do this and it's not made it yet. It stops. We have to wait. It might continue. We have to wait till up to 180, point, 180 seconds. You'll see why in just a few minutes. That's our upper time limit. But I usually ask the teams, how does your flag raise? Does it do like this? Is it quick or slow or does it go up like this? Does it go completely up? Or, but once it clears, they're good now to get the points, and it's got to stop. Once it stops moving, we stop the watches. But once it clears it, we're okay. But if it keeps moving, it says we do it till it stops. If it never stops, and it's still going 180 seconds, we're going to have to talk about whether it's the task completion or not. They pretty much completed the task, but they lost all their time points. So the ideal thing would be for it to go up and stop at 60 seconds because... You get two points for each second the device operates. All regional tournaments, the ideal or target time this year is 60 seconds. That means from when you let the plunger go until when the flag stops, ideally that would be 60 seconds. Now, they're full seconds. So if you go 60.1, that's 60 seconds, and you get two points times 60, 120 points. If you go 60.9, that's only 60 full seconds, that's 120 points. If you go 59.9, that's 59 seconds, that's 118 points. So it's for each full second, up, you've got to go over 60, but not to 61, because <coughs> once you go 61, you lose one point for each full second. And that's why we go to 180 seconds. You get 60 seconds for it to go and stop, get 120 points. But if it continues going another 120 seconds, which makes 180, you lose one point per second. You could lose the 120 points you've already built up in the first 60 seconds in the next 120. So you could go back to zero if you operate for three minutes. So the ideally, exactly 60. At the state, it's going to be different. We don't need to talk about the state right now, but the state, you're going to have a time like between 60 and 90, and you won't know that time until the very beginning of that day. When you come in for setup, we will tell you the ideal or target time and you'll adjust your device to match that time. Same rules will apply, two points per second up to the ideal time, and then you lose a point per second for each full second over up to 180 seconds. Now, there's one important rule I need to mention. Here's the device, here's the flag. Let's say that your flag's in there, it's not been operated yet. Now, whatever makes that flag operate, the action that makes this happen, you are not allowed to touch that. It says in the rules that you cannot have an action that directly leads to task completion. So you can't touch the action that makes that flag raise. If you do, we're going to assume you didn't touch it and it never raised and you lose all your time points. And you won't get task completion. No task completion, no time points. So do not, and we'll warn the teams, do not touch it right at the end. So whatever you have, however you design your device, that last part that makes this happen needs to be foolproof. It needs to always happen. If the thing before the, that action is foolproof, so that it's going to always trip it and make this happen. Because you're not allowed to trip it and make the flag come up yourself. So make sure that last part works because it's very, a lot of points will be lost if it does not. Penalties. I've already talked about if your device exceeds, 20, exceeds 60 centimeters in any one of the three dimensions, that's 25 points. So you can get 25 for each dimension or 75 points total. I just now mentioned one point for per each full second over the ideal time. You could lose up to 120 points that way at regionals. 
if while this is running, something flies out of the device or the balls that got separated, one of them rolls across the floor outside the device, it's a one-time 50-point penalty. So if a ball rolls out over here and one rolls out over there, you still only get one 50-point penalty. Touching is worth 15 points. Let me explain what that is. If your device stops and you need to reach in and touch something, reaching in and touch, you can do that. And when you do that, it's going to cost you 15 points. A lot of times when you reach in to touch it, it doesn't operate right away. So if you had to reach in and touch it again and do the same thing or at the same place, that's still only one touch. We have to do it. Sometimes we've seen teams jump in two or three times to get it right. That's one touch. However, if the machine operates a little bit and then stops again and you have to touch it, that's a second touch or two touches. That would be another 15-point penalty. Okay, so you really want to not touch it if you can help it. And remember, you can't touch the step that makes the flag raise at the very end. And when you touch it, if you actually operate one of the machines that was going to score points, you're going to lose that action. You're going to lose that 50 points because you did it yourself. Now, sometimes you touch something that's not part of one of the transfers, and that's fine. It might be a transfer you didn't plan to count for points. You get the 15-point penalty, but you don't lose any more than that, except time's running. Now, why do we call it Mission Possible? Because it can be done. Mission Possible, because it can be done. Have a lot of fun with Mission Possible this year. You can email the state office or call if you have questions. Thank you.